workers. I appreciate your help and all of you that are uh, not only in this building, but you're watching online. Uh, happy Easter. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And we are celebrating that fact today. And so I'm honored that you chose to uh, tune in and be a part of our service here in Prescott, Arizona. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 24. My wife and I uh, this year celebrated our wedding anniversary, 37th wedding anniversary, went to uh, Dallas, Texas. And as part of that, we uh, did something, you know, I travel all over the world, never look at anything, just preach, come home. But uh, we played tourist. We went to the Texas School Book Depository. This is the spot where in November 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald shot and killed President John F. Kennedy. And so this building is now a museum that you can go on the floor, you can actually see the spot where he fired the shot, and it is a, a fascinating building. It's filled with photos, it's filled with diagrams, but there are numbers of uh, stations or positions, they're, they're numbered. And one of the interesting things is that at many of these, they have recordings from actual eyewitnesses. I was there. I saw what happened in various aspects of that uh, monumental event in American history. The scripture that we're going to read, I'm using that as an illustration because in our scripture, Jesus appears to his disciples and he tells them that they are to be witnesses to his resurrection. And that is actually true for every true believer in Jesus Christ. This is what we need to be on this Easter morning. We are celebrating Jesus' resurrection. And Jesus says, I want you to be witnesses to the resurrection. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke 24. We're going to start reading in verse 36, and we'll read through verse 53, and you follow along. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and he said to them, Peace to be to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen his spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy, and they marveled, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled that were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written and thus it was necessary for the Christ, which is the Messiah, to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father uh, upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Witnesses to the resurrection. Let's begin with the first thought out of this passage. Let's talk about resurrection proof. 
Some people think that they can pick and choose which parts of the Bible that they think are true. Some people look and they say, virgin birth, nah, I don't, I don't believe that. A bloody death on the cross, that's barbaric, I don't believe in that. Or some, even the resurrection, no, that's not true, dead bodies don't rise. So, it, but they think somehow that that is still okay because we should just appreciate the good example and the moral teaching of Jesus Christ. All those other things, they don't really matter. But Jesus' purpose in coming to earth was to save people from their sin. Matthew 1, you'll call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus came to save us from the penalty of sin in hell and separation from God. He came to save us from the power of sin in this life. And so he says in this scripture, uses the word a number of times, must, must. This had to involve a sinless life. Because uh, uh, if not, then he would be under the same penalty of sin uh, as you and I. This, this is so important. You cannot pick and choose the parts of Christianity that, you, that appeal to you or that you happen to be able to understand and other parts. Some things are not optional. Right? If you work, some of your backyard mechanics, you work on your own vehicle, and when you are finished, you have parts left over. That's fine if it's your car. I ride in, I fly in planes. I do not want there to be parts left over if I'm flying in the plane. Words I never want to hear from a pilot or a surgeon oops, that's not going to work for me. So Jesus says it must first of all, involve a sinless life. Listen, in, we are under the debt or the penalty of sin. If someone said to you, how much do you owe to the bank or the credit card company? You know what, I'll pay it for you. And at first you're overjoyed. And then you ask them, by the way, do you have debt? And they say, yeah, 250,000. You're not going to be able to pay for my debt because you are under debt yourself. But the Bible says Jesus claimed to be perfect. He's called uh, the Lamb of God, the light of the world. He claimed literally to be God in the flesh. So he is claiming to be perfect because he had to. If he was not perfect, he could not pay for our sin. It must also involve a substitutionary death. I preached a, a sermon Wednesday night about this on the Passover. It covers me. And, uh, and it's speaking about uh, uh, the price of redemption, which is a Bible word, uh, which means the price paid to set someone else free. Verse 7, the Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men and crucified. And verse 46, it was necessary for Christ to suffer. He had to suffer. So, if Jesus is not sinless, if those claims are not true, then what he said he would do in forgiving our sins are also not true. If he is not the perfect Lamb of God, then that means for you and I today, there would be no forgiveness of sins, no help in life. There would be no future uh, hope of reuniting with loved ones that, have, are, that are already passed away. So this is part of why the Bible says the disciples were actually behind locked doors, not just for fear of people. They were, they were afraid because everything they put their hopes on were writing on this fact, Jesus has to be the sinless lamb of God to forgive our sins. But a wonderful life and a painful death would do no good unless Jesus also rose from the dead. Verse 46, it was necessary for, for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. So this is not a matter of opinion. Oh, I believe in the virgin birth. I don't believe in, I believe in. That is immaterial. 
the resurrection is the greatest proof that Jesus is who he said he was. Romans 1, 4 says, through the spirit of holiness, he was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the resurrection, the reason why Christians all around the world are, are so excited and they celebrate on Easter is because resurrection is proof that our sin has been paid for. If Jesus was killed on the cross and he stayed dead, then he would be simply another martyr for his beliefs. We would read about him and say, he said some nice things. Maybe we can try to emulate, but that doesn't really help us uh, today. The resurrection is God's seal or stamp of approval on the work that Jesus did on the cross. That the, that the claims of sin have been met. Sin and death have no more power over him. This is why in this scripture, Jesus is so insistent, look at my hands and my feet. Verse 39, he showed them because he is showing them something. I lived a perfect life in this body. I died a death on the cross as in your place in this body. And he says, I am alive again in this body. I'm not an apparition, a ghost, an idea in your head. He said, look at my hands and my feet. This is the foundation stone of Christianity is Jesus perfect life, death on the cross, and the fact that he is risen from the dead. You know, Christianity is the only religion that celebrates with an empty tomb. Other religions, they have founders that may have said uh, some, uh, some good things uh, or, or not, but they celebrate. You can go uh, and you can see the tomb of Muhammad uh, and they say his bones uh, are still there. Buddha, he may have had some uh, nice things to say, but his tomb, uh, it, the bones are still there. But Christianity is the only religion we celebrate with an empty tomb and the reason why is because that shows us that Jesus is exactly who he said he is God in the flesh in his body he lived the perfect life that we could not live ourselves died on the cross the death that we deserved but he did it in our place but by rising from the dead it shows us yes your sins can be forgiven. You know what? That tomb is still empty to this day. He's going to put a picture up on the tomb. This is the tomb of Jesus Christ. I've been there. I went inside just to make sure there are no bones there. And this is what we celebrate to this day. Every Christian on Easter uh, uh, Sunday, we are celebrating the fact of resurrection proof. Jesus is alive. And because he is alive, that means that our sins can be forgiven. Let's talk about a second thought. Let's talk about resurrection power. So Jesus asks them a question in verse 38. Why? Are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Troubled. The word means agitated. Things are boiling inside of them. Doubts. The word means internal discussions. In other words, they're looking at the events of life and they're saying, I cannot work this out. I don't understand it. Because that's how life is, isn't it? Events happen that are emotionally wrenching. They are painful. Life is not merely information. There are things that happen. 
to us in life. There can be betrayals in relationship. There can be breakdowns in, in relationships. There can be failures personally, financial stresses, sickness, even death of people that we love. Those are, those are emotionally wrenching. That's what's happening to the disciples. Having seen the one that they put their hopes in, they saw him beaten. They saw him nailed to the cross. Jesus is saying life is like that. Why? Why are there things boiling on the inside? Why are you so distressed that you can't work things out? Events happen in life that are completely confusing. People ask me in great sincerity sometimes, Pastor, why did that happen? And I have to give them my wisest pastoral answer. I have no clue. Because there are things that there is no answer for. You cannot, there's no index for some of the things we face in life. If God is in control, then why did this happen? These are some of the great questions of life. If God loves us, why did he allow that to happen? So the danger is that we can begin to interpret God through events. I come to conclusions about who God is based on look at what's going on around me in my life. God must not be in control. It must be that the devil is in control. Wicked people are in control because look at what, they're hap uh, what, what is happening in life. There are people I'm, I'm reading in Christian publications and websites, uh, they, they, are, they are distressed about the fact that we are not able to personally meet on Easter. What is the meaning behind this if Christians are not allowed to, uh, uh, to meet? Has God lost control? Is, is that what this means? And others who are conspiracy minded, you know what this is? This is, a, this is a plot to get Donald Trump. And I say, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Every country in the world is bankrupting their economy just to get Trump. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I get it. Or the Antichrist. I know the Antichrist is it. This is all about people think that, you know what, if God loved us, he wouldn't allow this to happen. But the resurrection is a demonstration of God's supernatural power. The resurrection is this, a dead body comes back to life. God is so powerful that he was able to overcome death. Verse 36, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace be to you. If you read the book of John, it says the doors were locked. So that tells us Jesus walked through a solid wall or he walked through a solid door. Bodies can't do that. But we're talking about supernatural power. Resurrection power is not simply what happened 2,000 years ago in history. Resurrection power is a transcendent dimension that is available in life now. To transcend means to go beyond. Jesus was able to do what normally a human body could not do. But this story that we read is not simply about what Jesus could do. It's about us. This is why we celebrate the resurrection is because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. We are able to overcome sin and live for God. Romans 6, 4, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also we should walk in newness of life. 
Salvation is not simply you are bound and addicted and tormented, so come to church so you can walk out bound, addicted, and tormented exactly like you came. No, no, no. Resurrection. When resurrection life came into the dead body of Jesus Christ, he did not stay dead. He overcame death. And the scripture that I just read says, here's the application for you and I. And that is that we are able to overcome. God is able to deliver and set people free. My brother-in-law, Paul Heimberg, he was a crystal meth addict before he was saved. He was horribly addicted, lost a, a beautiful home. He lost his business, almost lost his marriage to drugs, was absolutely hooked, bound by drugs. But in one moment, God touched him. He prayed a prayer to God and resurrection power came in Paul Heimberg. He not only was forgiven from sin, which meant he could go to heaven, he was delivered from drugs. He said one day, a few months after he was saved, he went outside the house and he smelled someone in the neighborhood cooking meth. He knew what that smell was, but he said he was surprised when he smelled it, he didn't crave meth any longer. Why? Because resurrection power is the power to set you free and overcome sin. Resurrection power. You heard that Pastor Jesse, he said in the announcements, he preached Friday night on Good Friday, a healing service. And we're getting many testimonies of people that they were healed. They weren't even here. They're watching online. Some of them weren't even watching live, watching it recorded. And the pa resurrection power, that same power that caused a dead body to come to life was able to reach into people's bodies and heal their, uh, their body. Acts 3, the disciples declared Jesus is alive and we are witnesses. How do we know Jesus is alive? Because they had just prayed for a man who was lame. He could not walk. And the Bible says that this man was able to stand up, walk, and leap a miracle of healing power, resurrection power. They said that's how we know Jesus is alive, not just history. History, we can see that power at work today. You know, the resurrection shows us that God is victorious. This is the hard part for people to work out in life. Why, are your heart so, why is your heart so troubled? Because they're interpreting God by life. As we got problems, and if you loved it, God never said that he would shield you from every problem. That's not what he promised, but what he says is he wins. In the battles of life, Revelations 1.18, I am the living one, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and of the grave. Jesus says, I hold the keys. Whoever has the keys is the one who controls access. They literally can determine what happens there. And Jesus says in life, because I rose from the dead, I have the keys. I'm not promising that you're never going to have battles or problems in life. But he says, I determine what happens. That means that he is able to overcome every attack by people who are wicked, by the devil, by every demon from hell. It was Joseph, he could say to his brothers after many bad things that happened to him through their own sin, he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He planned, he overcame. He didn't stop every problem, but he was able to turn it into something Good, verse 39, look at my hands and my feet, and there were wounds that were there. They could still see the scars or the holes that were there, 
because that's a great picture. He says, you know what? I'm not removing every hole and every scar and problem in life. But he says, but now these scars are transformed into something good. Having a hole in your hand is not good unless it's Jesus paying for you. I turn bad things and I use them for good. Jesus also tells us the resurrection is this. God gives us ultimate hope. Even death is not the end. 1 Corinthians 15, 53 through 55, for this corruptible, let's talk about our bodies, must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible will put on incorruption, mortal put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Here is Jesus Christ. I have the keys of death and the grave. In this life, I can overcome attacks. And even if people die, that is not the end. They're still going to win because of the resurrection power. The resurrection shows us, it gives us the power to have relationship with God. If you think about it, this is kind of a strange story. If you were founding a religion, and some people say, you know, the whole Bible is made up. If you, if you, were, if you, were, if you were founding a religion, if you were making up a story that you wanted everybody to base it on, here it is, and Jesus walks through the wall. It's like, yes, and if it was Hollywood, there'd be lights and music and smoke. And then Jesus says, if he's from the South, he would have said, y'all got anything to eat? Right? It's like, <laughs> that, that kind of doesn't fit the story. You know what I mean? It's like this awesome, he walked through the wall. You know why that story is there? Because in ancient times, eating a meal together had real significance. It wasn't just a hunger issue. When you ate a meal with someone, you were saying, I value your relationship. The resurrection shows us God wants to have relationship with you. You can know him. Revelations 3.20, look, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come in we will share a meal together as friends. Christianity is not simply come to church every once in a while or do you believe these facts? Jesus can be known personally. He knows you. He can speak to you. You can speak to him. This is resurrection power. Final thought. Let's talk about resurrection purpose. Jesus not only rose from the dead. They didn't just hear about this. They didn't just get letters, you know. Are you aware that Jesus rose from the dead? Our story is just one of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ. He deliberately appeared to people. He appeared to the women at the tomb. Uh, uh, Peter and John uh, at the tomb uh, hear the disciples behind locked doors, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, 500 people at once, all the different things. So he tells us why did he show up personally rather than just send them a letter? I'm still alive, sign Jesus. And, and verse 48 says, why is because you are to be witnesses. So in other words, other people should learn about the resurrection. They should understand the resurrection, not simply through reading about it in the Bible. He says they should learn about and understand the resurrection through us, through believers in Jesus Christ. Look at how we become witnesses. We, first of all, have the witness of a changed life. A witness is someone who has evidence or proof. You do not get on the witness stand and said, I read a book about it. 
Now, all they want to know is, what do you personally know? What did you see? What did you experience? Change lives are actually the greatest proof of Christianity. I believe the Bible is true, and that would be enough, but change lives demonstrate the truth and the proof of Christianity. You know, atheism can't produce evidence of reality. I have never met an atheist who said, I was a drug addict, and then I decided there is no God. And all of a sudden, I had no more craving for drugs. Imagine, have you seen this in the news the last few years? They have atheist churches. How weird is that? I would like to praise nobody. <laughs> right? My marriage, man, we were on the rocks. And then I decided there is no God. And ever since then, we love each other. But it's Christianity. Charles Bradlaugh was a famous atheist in England many years ago. And in one of the slums of England, there was a pastor named Hugh Price. He was ministering in a mission area, a rough area of uh, uh, London. The atheist Bradlaugh, he challenged Pastor Hughes to debate with him the validity of the claims of Christianity. Pastor Price immediately accepted the challenge, said, yes, I will debate you. And he said, I propose to you that we bring concrete evidences of the validity of our beliefs in the form of men and women whose lives have been transformed for the good through our teaching. Pastor Price said, I will bring a hundred men and women whose lives have been transformed by Jesus Christ. And he says, I challenge you, you bring a hundred. And he brought it down. Finally, he says, I challenge you, in fact, bring even one person that their life has been uplifted through your atheistic teachings. In answer, Charles Bradlaugh publicly withdrew his challenge for the debate. Christianity, we become witnesses when our lives change. That's why it matters how you live. Because our lives are the testimony. Number two, there's the witness of testimony. A witness is one who tells what they know, what they experience. Verse 47, repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations. Is if Jesus is alive, he says, you know what I want you to do? I want you to tell somebody. I want you to open your mouth wherever you're at. Tell them. Jesus is alive and your sins can be forgiven because he lived a perfect life, died in your place, and is risen from the dead. And finally, there's the witness of joy. If Jesus is alive, that means we should approach life differently than people who don't know Jesus. Verse 52 and 53, they worshiped him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. So if you know Jesus is alive and he has the keys of hell and death in all of life, if he rules, you should approach life differently. That means in problems. You will have problems, even if you're a Christian. But it should change how you approach it because we have the hope of supernatural power that God could step in and change things. Even tragedies. The hope that believers have is that this life is not all there is, that there is life beyond the grave. My oldest sister, Karen, she was very, very sick. She had cystic fibrosis. She had a double lung transplant. She had, I don't remember, diabetes. She was starting a disease collection. I said, you, you don't, it, it's not a contest. You don't have to keep on having these diseases. My sister Karen was praying for healing. Ultimately, she did not get healed. It finally came where it was clear she was not going to make it. Was in the hospital in 2002. And a few hours before she went unconscious and then died, she was still able to write and she wrote down messages for family, but I have the actual note 
that is here, and don't try to read everything, but look at the top line. This is her message, knowing that she is about to die. She said, tell them, I win in the end. She didn't say, not fair that I'm sick. I don't understand why didn't God, is even if I die, tell them I win in the end. You know why? The resurrection. The resurrection changes everything. If Jesus is alive, we can know that our sins can be forgiven. We can be delivered from the power of our sins, hope for power in our lives now. And when we die, the Bible says Jesus was simply the first fruits, that we too will rise from the dead. Death is not the end. I'm going to see my sister again. I'm going to see my mother again. I'm going to see my father-in-law again because Jesus is alive so my question as I bring this message to a close, if you're watching right now, do you have that kind of hope? Do you have that kind of optimism that is not just based on a positive mental attitude? Do you have something on the inside that you can say, because Jesus is alive, it changes everything. Because you can know that, and I'm telling you, I am a witness of the resurrection, Jesus is risen from the dead. I want you to bow your heads. Close your eyes all across this place. Thank God. Now, while our heads are bowed, before we do anything else, we're going to receive communion in a few moments. But before we do that, I want to speak first of all. There are people, perhaps you are watching this online. I spoke about the fact that Jesus lived a sinless life that you could never live. I could never live a sinless life. That he died on the cross in your place, in my place. And today we're celebrating that he is risen from the dead. That shows that it is true. You can be forgiven of your sins. You can be delivered from the power of sin and you can have the hope of resurrection that you can spend eternity with God in heaven. If you have been watching this and you don't have that kind of confidence, Easter would be a wonderful day to get your heart right with God. And I'm asking right now, there are people that are watching online, I cannot see you, but God can see you. And what I'm asking is, do you want what Jesus did on the cross to be made real inside of you? Resurrection power can be brought into your heart. If you want that, I want you to do something. I can't see it, but wherever you're at, God can. I want you to do this. I want you to lift up your hand in the air. And by lifting your hand, you're saying, I want Jesus to forgive me of my sins. Each service, we've been having reports of people who said, I lifted my hand. I prayed and God forgave me. All across, not only this building, but everywhere you're watching this, if that's what you want, lift up your hand right now. Some of you are backslidden. In the past, maybe you knew Jesus, but like the disciples, events of life, it, it spun your head. You can't work it out and you turned away. God has not given up on you. How many backsliders? You say, I want to get right. I want to come home. Lift up your hand. Hold up your hand all across this place as God would deal with you. Thank God. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to help you to pray. God wants to hear your words the Bible says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, that is what God wants you to do. So I'm going to help you to pray. I want you to say it wherever you're at. Say this out loud after me. I want you to say, God in heaven, I believe in Jesus Christ that he died for my sins on the cross. 
and he rose from the dead to show his power. I choose to turn away from my sin. I ask you to forgive me. Come into my heart and give me the power to live for you from this moment on. In Jesus' name, I thank you for it. Amen. Amen. I want to pray right now for those that just prayed, God, wherever they are, you have seen the words that they have just spoken before you. You've seen their heart. People want to get right with you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your sinless life, your perfect death and rising from the dead. God, now make resurrection power real. Let the power of the Holy Spirit fill these people. God, take away the craving for addictions. Set them free right now. Give them the power to live a new life, Lord God. And I thank you for the hope of resurrection life and resurrection power that we have through Jesus Christ. And I thank you for it. Amen. Let's thank God for saving these people. God, right now, oh God, I thank you that you are faithful. God, you have faithfully spoken. God, you have honored your word that I declared. God, I'm grateful for salvation. Thank you for power that is not of us. It comes from you, and I thank you for it. Oh, God, I am so grateful. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We want to, in just a moment, we're going to receive communion. Let's sing that song, Because He Lives. Let's sing that in worship. I want you to take the time in this building. If you're at home, we're going to sing that song together. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Let's sing that. God, for the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Father God, we thank you, Lord God. We praise and bless you, Lord God. Worthy is the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. We're now going to celebrate uh, communion together. The, the staff is going to come. They're going to join me at the table. And we're going to celebrate this together. Pastor Jesse, Pastor Mitchell, Pastor Stephen is going to come. We actually do have another member of staff. You just don't see him because of limited uh, numbers that we're able to have. Is Pastor Diego is uh, he's interpreting in the back. Thank God. So we're going to uh, celebrate communion together. We traditionally we do it uh, at Easter time, and part of the reason why Easter was uh, the time of year. In the Jewish tradition that was Passover and uh, the, I preached on this on Wednesday and so we choose to do it during this season. I want to read the book of Matthew chapter 26. The, uh, the disciples were used to in their culture every single year they would gather together in homes uh, with their families and they would celebrate the Passover meal that uh, I preach about it Wednesday, since the time of the Exodus in, from Egypt, that they had celebrated this. And Jesus told his disciples that they're going to celebrate, and it's a whole message in itself, the preparation of the room. But Jesus, instead of meeting with the family, he met with his spiritual family, with the disciples. And he too wanted to join together with them and celebrate this meal, but he changed the elements of this. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 26, he says, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, for this is my body. 
Now the Jews from the time of Moses, and they celebrated the first Passover in Egypt, is at that time they began to eat this meal together every year at this time. And it had a number of, of elements. And one of the things I told you on Wednesday is that they had someone, they called him the presider. It was not, the point was not just simply to eat, but you had someone who explained. Now, normally what he would say when they got to the element of the bread is he would say, this is the bread of affliction which our fathers suffered and ate in the wilderness. They suffered that we might be redeemed. So the disciples, perhaps that what they were expecting Jesus to say as he distributes the bread, but instead he says, this is my body. What you've been doing for all those years, it's actually about me. I said that when Jesus rose from the dead, he showed them his body. Central to Christianity is the fact that Jesus came in a human body. He didn't come as an apparition, as a spirit, as a dream. That he came in a human body, lived a perfect life, and ultimately allowed his body to be broken for us. And Jesus says, every time you celebrate this meal together or you celebrate this rite together, what we are celebrating first of all is that Jesus had a body, a perfect human body, and therefore because he came in about... Christianity is the greatest story in time or eternity, a rescue mission. God saw us in sin and he said, the only answer is I have to come out of heaven. I have to become a human being. I have to become a man. And that's what we're celebrating. Jesus said, this is my body. We are going to uh, partake together. Each of the staff will take, if you have your if you're from our local church, we had a, uh, a, a kit that included uh, the wafer together. And uh, we are going to, right now, we are going to first of all memorialize and celebrate the fact that Jesus came in a human body to rescue us for our sins. Pastor Jesse, I want you to first of all hold up this before the Lord as we celebrate together and as we hold it up to memorialize Pastor Jesse is going to thank God for what he's doing through this. Father God, we thank you for the bread of life that came down from heaven, was sinless, spotless, pure and holy on our behalf. We thank you for your body that was broken for us at the cross Paying for our redemption, paying for our uh, uh, healing, uh, that we can know you, that we can know God and be in relationship with him. We thank you as we partake together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Then let's partake together. And then we move on. Verse 27, then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The Passover, as I preached on Wednesday, it was all about blood that was shed a lamb had to die in their place as a substitute. Nothing else would be enough showing how serious our sin was. But God says, I love you so much, I will make a way. And that is death in your place. You should be the one who dies. But instead, I will accept a substitute. As part of this, they drank the cup. They were remembering. They no longer had to put the blood every year, but the cup symbolized that blood from many years ago. And Jesus, again now, the familiar 
They had done this all their lives, but now he says, this is my blood, which is shed for you, knowing that in just a few hours, he is going to be beaten and whipped, nailed to a cross, a crown of thorns beaten into his scalp. Blood is going to flow. And Jesus said, just like the lamb died in your place so you could go free and not be judged, he said, that is what I am going to do. My blood will be shed for the remission of sins. You can be forgiven. That is what we're celebrating in communion. Thank God, I don't care what you have done in the past, the blood of Jesus, the Bible says, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And we are celebrating, we are deliberately, by partaking of this element together of the cup, we are celebrating the fact the blood of Jesus forgives our sins. Pastor Cassio is going to uh, pray again. I want you to take your, the element of the cup. Hold that for a moment. Pastor Cassio is going to pray, and then we're all going to partake together. Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you for your precious blood that was poured out on our behalf. God, you died in our place. You shed your blood, and your blood is what covers our sin. God, we thank you this morning. Jesus, we are grateful that your blood is what makes us clean. It's what separates us. God, we thank you uh, for all that you've done. We ask now, God, you would bless this. Thank you for all you've done on the cross, the blood shed on our behalf in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all partake together. Thank God. Then let's sing that song to, together before we are dismissed. Because he lives, let's sing that again. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. I know he holds the future and Christ is worth the living just because. Let's worship God together. Let's thank God for his blood. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, we praise you. Thank you for coming for our sins. Thank you for dying on the cross and rising from the dead. Thank you for the hope of resurrection, the hope of power and deliverance, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Jesus is risen from the dead. Thank God. Amen. We're going to bring this service to a close, and I'm encouraging.